This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. And with Dracula, Dracula was that first film. I remember seeing Dracula in the theater opening, and it was a huge yeah. opening. I remember it was because that it saved, saved Francis's life and say and but set records. Nobody could believe how big it opened. It was, and it was, if I remember correctly, one of the best trailers I had ever yeah. seen. Sid Gannis, Sid Gannis. Oh my God, Incredible what trailer. what a trailer editor! I mean, because that trailer sold the movie so beautifully, yeah. and the way tra- and then way in the way Francis went about it with this whole old kind of like turn of the century style filmmaking and using older technologies and reversing the film, and it was just so rich and the transitions and how he was able to do it. But you were telling me a story before we we, we started recording. Um, that Francis uh, made a phone call to you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Cause... Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, Dra- when Dracula sets were being built, when Hook was coming down, so it was kind of a heady time for me. But we'd had, we'd had, we were deep in post production and had a release date right around Halloween in 1992. Um, and Francis had been in the editing room nonstop, and we'd had two or three disastrous previews. I mean, just disastrous. And. Um, I watched this courageous man go, oh, well, it's another rewrite. Let's go back, you know, and just the studio is panicking and they're wanting to shut it down and come and take over and what have you. So um, it was about mid, late summer. We're opening in October, mid to summer. I get a phone call at midnight uh, uh, in New York from Francis. Uh, and when, you know, Mr. Coppola calls, you, you don't, you wake up um, and, he said, oh, well, okay, uh, Jim, I want you to get on a plane in the morning and come out here as fast as you can. He said, uh, um, I hate the film. I hate the script. I hate you. I hate the fact you ever wrote it. I hate the actors. I hate the studio. I hate the whole idea that I ever got involved in this piece of shit. I want to show you that movie. Wow. So great great going, sales pitch. Yay. <laughs> I can't wait. Um, so the next night I'm there and I'm in San Francisco and I don't to Judy, I don't know how long I'm gone. I don't know what's happening. I don't know if this is a day trip, if I'm being fired, if the movies, you know, I don't know what's happening. So the next evening I'm down in the Godfather screening room. There is Zoetrope, as, as Francis called the Bohemian Amblin, you know, the big, <laughs> big Godfather couches and, and cigars and wine and liquor and two women that spoke Romanian. I don't know why they were there, but there were these two women. I think they were, you know, bite my throat or something. Right. Uh, and Francis didn't even come down. He called me from the penthouse. Said, okay, good. You're here. You're fine. You know, okay. All right. Said, I want you to call me after you screen the movie and I'll come down and we'll talk. This is about 10 o'clock at night. So by 1030, I'm drunk. <laughs> um, by the time the film is over, I'm can, I, I'm so angry, I'm so pissed. I mean, uh, he he was right. He was a piece of shit. Wow. You know, and I had been to all the dailies. The we rehearsed. We did then this incredible prep that he uh, learned yeah. from him. Uh, prep, all the prep he did. All I the saw. Yeah. All you know, uh, uh, the storyboards that we did. The screenplay was lauded by the actors. You know, there, there wasn't a bunch of people saying this suck. Throw it out. They wanted to add more. Um, and I'm going, how did this happen? So then Francis comes down uh, in his dapper, you know, we're smoking robe and a cravat and stuff, little pointed Turkish shoes and, you know, and all happy and said, you didn't call me. I said, yeah, I, I, I hate you too. <laughs> I, hate, I hate it too. So he said, let me tell you, the, let me, like a big kid, let me tell you the film I wanted, we're going to make. And I'm going, didn't we just make this movie? You know? And he pitched me what I thought we'd shot. But what I began to recognize um, is that during the shooting, we had we, we sat in the next two weeks and went through every footage, all the footage we had, and went through the existing cut. And we began to identify pieces of narrative that the film needed. Not whole scenes to be reshot, but pieces, transitions, piece of narration, an insert here, you know. Um, and I kept saying to friends, there's got to be a way to head this off at the pass. So you don't want to get the editing room. You fix some of this in the script. There's got to be a way to measure that script and, 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 uh, manage that script. So it's telling you a whole lot more than, cause we had, we, we were thought we were golden. I had the greatest director in the world and here we are in the editing room panicked. 
you know. And wow. I said, especially because indie filmmakers don't have the money to bring back, you know, Winona Ryder and and Gary, Gary you know, and Ke- and Keanu and, and, and everything. You know, they don't have that kind of money. They they're in the editor room going, "We're fucked." Right. So this is where the heart chart came from. Uh, I'll just give you an example of the. We didn't shoot any new scenes. We shot pieces. We realized that we had never seen Dracula and Mina together. I mean, uh, the, his wife, wife together before he went to battle. So when she hands him the helmet, you know, and he goes off to battle, um, um, the ending was the big controversy because the ending didn't work. The ending, uh, she stabs him and 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 uh, plunges the knife into him, and she's redeemed, and he dies at peace, and he's redeemed. And then she walks out the door and walks into the arms of Keanu Reeves. And the audience was like booing. No. And I kept saying to Francis, that's not who they want to see. They want to see when they want to see Winona and Gary stay together somehow. Forever. <laughs> yeah, forever. So he had George Lucas and Mike um, Mingella, uh, not, uh, yeah, uh, Hellboy, watch the film to see. Yeah, we'd done a cut. We'd done, we spruced it up and we told them where we were going to fill in these blanks and that sort of thing. We got to the ending, and George said, "You broke your rules. You you, you don't have the right ending." Uh, she has to cut off his head, which is the rules you set up in the film to totally redeem him. She's got to complete the mission, and then not walk out the door in Yukon and Reese's arms. So I remember Francis calling me, and he said, uh, "Okay, George saw the film, and um, he thinks that you know we got to do this." And he said, "And, and he said, do you think we can? Um, you think Winona would?" you know, come back and work with Gary if she could cut off his head. And I said, I think that's the only way you'll get, you'll get her back. Because if, 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 if I don't mean to, had, I don't mean to step. Legendary, not getting along, you know. They, yeah, they had a long. rough, a rough time on that yeah. set from what I heard. Legendary. Yeah. So we came back and, and put that chapel scene back up together. He had built all those sets like theater sets so he could just fold them out. You wow. know, it was incredible. Wow. Um, save the gargoyles. So the, in that last scene where you see the, all, of, all of that seamless work, some of the close-ups and some of the wide shots are shot a year apart. And wow. you're seamless. They had to do wigs. They had to do all this stuff. you know. And she cuts off his head. And then Roman came up with the idea of the beautiful um, uh, mosaic and the ceiling of them mm-hmm. together, you know, flying together. Um, but I kept saying there has to be a way to – in the screenplay form, while you're doing the script to measure these emotional journeys your characters are going on and how to head some of this off of the path. We should have caught the fact that she had to cut off his head. You know, we'd have followed the emotional journey of, of what Carrie always had to do to Sadie by cutting off her head and taking out her heart. You know, if, we'd, if, I'd, if I'd have been measuring that emotional journey instead of just it'd been a great scene, you know. So uh, he said, well, why don't you start with these three questions? And he gave me three journalist questions, which was the beginning of the heart chart. And the questions were very simple. Uh, and, I re- and I figured, and if I, he said, just answer those three questions <clears throat> before you start anything again, before you start a story. And so I started using the questions, and then I expanded them to 10 questions, and I started drawing these charts these actual hand-drawing charts to measure the heartbeat and the emotional journey of the characters. Not an outline, not cards on the wall, because even cards on the wall, I get lost. Mm-hmm. Where am I emotionally? Where am I pace-wise? Where, how important is this? So the chart, the chart was uh, like your, your EKG when you get your heartbeat. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, those of you who are old enough to do that. And uh, I, I saw, so we started out by drawing them. I see Austin Film Festival, one of the very early charts. Yeah, yeah, I see it, I see it. And then in 2015, Guy Goldstein came to me, who did Writer's Duet, and he said, I can do an app. So now we're an online app. Right. That is that is the Dracula chart, the very first chart I ever did. Okay. And there, there's the drawn one. So, and I started doing it at the Austin Film Festival every year, but doing my films. And then people said, well, you wrote those films. You, you, know, you, you, you know you did that on purpose. And I went, ah. So we started to take doing other people's films. So I've done um, Jordan Peele, Get Out. I've done um, um, Jamie and uh, La La Land, um, Bo Burnham, Eighth Grade, uh, the, the Wedding Crashers, uh, mm-hmm. you know, uh, Batman. I mean, suddenly you start applying these principles to it. And 
if you just follow this, you'll never face a blank page. You'll never be, you'll never be writer's block. It does. I don't believe in writer's block. Mm -hmm. My my daughter just said it yesterday on her podcast. She doesn't believe in writer's block either. That there are ways, if you know craft, you're always jumpstarting, you're always writing and answering questions and solving problems. So uh, the heart chart is, this is my booklet. Mm -hmm. It used to just be printed up and given away. That's how thick it is. (laughs) How how thick is Robert McKee's book? A bit thicker. And and how much dust is it collecting on your shelf? A lot. Yeah. (laughs) Chris Vogler has the only book that's as thick as McKee that's, that should be used. Now, listen, McKee did a great, did a lot for the screenwriting trade. Sure. You know, this is all you need, and it says right there: never face a blank page again. You have some shitty ones, you know, but you won't be blank. So this, they finally begged me to put this together at Austin, and we just started it about three or four years ago, and it's caught on. And the app, the chart you saw, is now available online. And it's an opt-in, opt-out. It's a monthly subscription, and you can, it saves everything in the cloud. Every version you make, every every change you make, um, and um, uh, if you go to the website, you can see the examples and you can see it come to life. I needed it because it showed me an emotional journey, what was pulling my characters through the narrative instead of being pushed, and that's what I'd been doing all the, up until Dracula. You'd been pushing. I pushed everything. And even even Hook, I learned a lot on Hook of finding character. If you do this, you will be writing character-driven narratives as opposed to plot-driven. Uh, and uh, it's even now being used in some, by some showrunners and TV to where they can take the chart and do a whole season. Mm. You know, it really lets you see on one page the emotional journey your characters can go through instead of an outline. You know, now there's a lot of work you do before that. I mean, there's a lot of writing you do before you put it on the chart. But those three questions that Francis gave me is where, where this all started. I went, oh my god! And there's and people go, oh that's easy. You know, what does my character want? What do they need? What are they afraid of? What you know? What 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 what, what is their visible tangible goal? What is you know? Is it a satisfying ending? Because the biggest one for me is, do you have a satisfying ending? Not happy, not sad, not good or bad, but have you satisfied your audience? with the journey you've taken them on. And I know everybody's got plenty of movies and TV series where they didn't like the ending of the series, they didn't like the end of the season, or they didn't like the end of the, you know, um, uh, like Lost. Or, yeah, um, so Lost um, is a bad... Or, uh, you know... Well, a good, a good example of a movie, that a show that did had a had a horrible ending that people hated was Lost. But another a great one, I feel, is Breaking Bad. Like Breaking, exactly. Breaking exactly. Bad's ending was... Totally perfect and satisfying yeah, totally and like Vince did a perfect job and that was a yeah. heavy that was a lot of weight yeah. to carry because he was so good almost every episode of that series was amazing and it just kind of kept growing yeah. and yeah. growing yeah. and if he if he missed the landing the whole thing comes crashing oh, thing. It's like Sopranos ever been, the, the last episode of the Sopranos you know mm-hmm. people like are the last even the last episode of Game of Thrones like oh, yeah. people pulling their hair out. So yeah. these are all things that I think you can, uh, I, Vogler and I both agree on this. There are certain storytelling principles in the ether of the universe you can't fuck with. Yeah. You can try and they're going to get you. Right. Or you can learn to manage them and, and use them to your benefit. Like structure for me is, is not a formula. Structure for me is lightning in the bottle. It'll actually liberate you if you know structure. Uh, so my whole thing is about structure and about character driven narratives um, and, um, it's the only way I've survived. Uh, it, you know, it's not one of those things where I'm a working writer. I do use this every single day in my, in my craft. I'm adapting a book right now for Scott Wynne. That's how I adapt. I actually do mm-hmm. notes and well, every, and I'm using this, I use these principles, these questions, these signposts in every single thing I do. And you'll see some quotes from, from some pretty big writers that, that, that have, didn't want to know about it until they saw what I did with the chart. And they went, Oh my God, you know more about the movie than I do. You know, and I directed or I wrote it. So, so, um, and it's, it's great for threshold writers. It's a lot of writers that are struggling to try to figure out how, you know, how do I get to be that? Mm-hmm. They, I've seen them stop in the middle of my sessions and go and solve a problem and come back and say, I just solved it. You know, I know what I'm missing. Well, and it's, I want it to be mechanical, not some, you know, spiritual guided talent that you, you can only have if you're special. 
You right. know, that it really, that there really is a mechanical process to what we do. 